everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Primrose. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and my channel is dedicated to discussing issues about academics, career, and adulting. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking to you about applying for a South Africa study permit based on my personal experience as I have studied in South Africa from undergraduate through to postgraduate studies and now enrolled as a postdoctoral research fellow. I speak also from my experience having applied from my home country, Zimbabwe, having applied from within South Africa, and also having applied from the Kingdom of Eswatini, where I have temporary residence. Um, just to note, I'm going to be speaking a lot about the DHA, which is the Department of Home Affairs, as well as VFS, which is the Visa Facilitation Services. I stand to be corrected, but I do believe that's what VFS stands for. So depending on where you are applying from, you might note that, for example, in my case, in Eswatini, I had to apply at the South African High Commissioner's offices and at Z in Zimbabwe, where there's a Visa Facilitation Services Center, so I had to go there and apply through that center. But before, when I was applying during my undergraduate studies, I know that we also had to go to the South African High Commissioner's offices. In South Africa, you don't interface with Home Affairs officials. There are various visa facilitation services. So if you look up VFS DHA South Africa, you'll be able to locate those services. I will put relevant links in the section below so that you will have access to the various relevant forms and various um, attachments that I'm going to be talking about throughout this conversation. So I'm using a list which I used last year when I was renewing my study visa and I'm going to be commenting on various items on this list based of course on my experience. Number one, you need to have a duly completed form. So this form has to be online if you are applying through the visa facilitation centers. However, I do know that with most application centers that are South African High Commissioner offices, they usually give you the hard copy of a form. So check in with the office in the relevant country where you're applying from to see whether they want your duly completed online form as well as the hard copy of that or whether you have to have a hand filled or rather handwritten on form. And then number two, the most important document, if you're going to be studying in a foreign country, of course, you need to have a valid passport. And here it stipulates that this passport should be expiring no less than 30 days after the expiry of the intended date of departure from the Republic. What I advise anyone is to say that if you're looking to go elsewhere to study, rather have a new passport, especially in the event that the passport that you currently have expires within three years. Because what happens is that usually you have a passport which is about to expire, but then you're applying for studies that are perhaps maybe four years, five years, three years, and so forth. So you don't want to go through the inconvenience of renewing your current passport while studying. And also, you have to note that these people that look at your permit application, the people that adjudicate your study visa application, will only give you a permit which is in line with the expiry date in your passport. So even if you're applying for a five-year program and your passport expires in two years, they're going to give you a two-year permit. In line with the passport, I believe that, you know, you have documents that build up to the passport. Your national ID document as well as your birth certificate. Have these in hand, even if they've not been asked for, because people that do this adjudication or immigration offices tend to ask for things that are not on these lists. And then they'll be telling you that, you know, you can't just have a passport. We need to confirm that the ID number on your passport is the same ID number on your national registration card or national ID booklet. And sometimes they'll be like, oh, we need proof of birth in this country since you said you were born in Zimbabwe. So then I always have my birth certificate as well as my national ID card, the originals, a certified photocopy, as well as a copy that is not certified. So have these ID documents together with your passport that does not expire soon or that does not expire during the course of the studies that you intend to apply for. Okay, so here on this list, I've got, uh, there's a note to say that the application is supposed to be submitted in person. Check with the offices that you want to apply through to see what the procedures are if you need to be sending someone to apply for you. Some people apply through agencies. The agents will tell you what you need to do. Some people may be sick or they are hindered from going to the 
relevant services and you want to send someone, make sure that you complete the relevant affidavit that supports you sending that particular person and endorsing them as the person that will submit or collect um, the outcome, uh, that will submit your documents as well as maybe collect the outcome of your visa application. I have here a yellow fever vaccination certificate if you have traveled or intend to travel from or transit through a yellow fever endemic area. I know within Southern Africa, I think Zambia is one of those countries where if you go there, if you're going to be passing through Zambia, you may need to provide a yellow fever vaccination certificate. So just check your recent travels, past travels, how you're going to be traveling to South Africa and make sure that if there's need for you to have a yellow fever vaccination certificate, you have that in hand. However, if you're just coming from Zimbabwe into South Africa, you don't need one. Coming from Esotini into South Africa, you also don't need one. Um, the most important next on the list is police clearance certificates issued by the police or security authority in each country where the relevant applicant has resided for 12 months or longer after attaining the age of 18 years in respect of criminal records or the character of that applicant which certificate shall not be older than six months at the time of its submission so basically you need police clearance certificates from every country where you've stayed for more than a year after attaining the age of 18 and these police clearance certificates need to be not older than six months this is one thing that caused a lot of trouble when I was trying to apply for my first study permit because I had resided in the city for more than a year after attaining the age of 18 and it was so difficult attaining the police clearance from that particular country while I was in Zimbabwe. So make sure that if you stayed in different countries for more than a year, you need to make sure that you gather the police clearance certificates from those various countries within ample time for you to be able to submit your application and get it, you know, are checked and adjudicated so that you make it in time to go back to school. So police clearance certificates from every country where you've stayed after the age of 18 years for the duration of 12 months or longer. Another important thing, so for example, I may be based in Eswatini, right? Um, and I haven't stayed there for more than a year, but I'm applying for a study permit through the offices in Eswatini. Because they are granting me that privilege as a temporary resident, it just makes sense for me to provide police clearance certificates from South Africa and Zimbabwe, where I've lived for more than a year after the age of 18, as well as from Eswatini. It doesn't hurt anyone because I'll be applying from within South Africa. New developments, I noticed last year when I applied for uh, my study permit renewal in South Africa, the visa facilitation services will take your fingerprints and anything that is relevant to forward to the South African police services. So you no longer need to go through the whole process of applying for a South Africa uh, police clearance certificate within South Africa if you're applying at a visa facilitation center within the Republic. However, I stand to be corrected. Just double check this information. If you're definitely applying from Zimbabwe, I know that it's quite easy to get a police clearance within like a day or three days, whatever the case may be, because they've got different payment plans. So that one is usually not a very difficult to get within a short space of time, provided you have the amount of money that is required to fast track the process. The Eswatini one usually takes 24 hours, so I really never had issues with that. I know that if I go there today, I'll be able to get my police clearance certificate tomorrow. The South African police clearance is the one that usually took a long time because, for example, um, I was based in Cape Town and everything is done centrally in Pretoria at head office. So it would take, for example, three to six, eight weeks for them to, you know, produce the police clearance certificate. So I always had to budget enough time for me to get that. However, like I said last year, I didn't need to do that because the visa facilitation services uh, people were able to take all the biometric data they needed in order to forward to the South African police services, also known as SAPS. Okay, now on to you need to have a medical report done by a certified general practitioner as a GP, medical doctor, and you also need a radiological report. This should be provided um, if you know you're above the age of 12 years and if you're not pregnant. I mean, if you're pregnant, there should be something like a medical note accompanying your application to state why you could not do, you know, a radiological report. They usually do this, I think, to check for tuberculosis. I'm not sure what else it is for. And try and get this through your medical aid 
find out which doctors, which radiological centers take your medical aid so that you don't pay a lot. However, if you don't, then you just have to pay up what is required by those practitioners. You need to go to them with forms that are provided by the Department of Home Affairs. I've put down a link to the medical report form as well as to the radiological report form and so that you can maybe download these if you're going to need them. And then if you're married, you need a marriage certificate. Um, if you have a spouse in the Republic, you need proof that you know you have a spouse in the Republic. I don't know so much about this, so I'm not going to dwell on it. And then the next one, you need an affidavit where a spouse or relationship to a South African citizen or resident is applicable. Also, it's not information that I know much about because I'm single, I'm not married, I don't have a partner who's in South Africa or also in the world. If you're divorced, you also need to provide proof of that. Um, also does not apply to me and then if you've got children that you are traveling with you need to prove that maybe you've got a court order granting you full or specific parental responsibilities to that particular child um, and then there's also you need written consent from both parents and full parental responsibilities where applicable this is very tricky and it usually depends on the person who's going to be reviewing your application, especially the person that takes the documents that you bring to the visa facilitation desk or to the, you know, to the desk at the South African High Commission. So usually, I think if you're doing your undergraduate studies or if your parents are paying towards your medical aid or if your parents or guardians are paying for your school fees and whatnot, you need to have a letter from them. And in that letter, make sure you know they've written it formally, the whole business style letter, and they've indicated their passport number or national ID number, and you have a copy of those ID documents that are quoted in the letter. So for example, I'd have my father having to say that I X Y Z do hereby confirm that I'm Primrose ZJ Bima's father, and maybe put like my passport number after that. And then that's where also now the birth certificate comes in because remember i told you always carry such documents because they may be needed for other references and then he'll say that i confirm that i will be sp fully sponsoring primrose's medical aid as well as personal expenses and school fees and then which something which i'll speak about later then you have to make sure that you've included a proof of funds for that particular person so for example a three months bank statement that comes from my father because he's the one that is writing this letter. Now, later on in life, because I am now fending for myself, so last year when I was applying for my study permit, I basically wrote a letter to confirm that I'm the person who is number one, the applicant, number two, the one who is going to be sponsoring my stay in South Africa, number three, the person who's going to be paying towards other expenses and whatnot. And then I attached, of course, a bank statement that is in my name and a proof of my bank account from my particular bank because it will also have my passport number. So make sure that you do have details of whoever is going to be funding your studies when you're in the Republic. In the event that you're getting a scholarship, make sure that the scholarship board or institution has also written a letter to confirm what exactly they'll be covering. And sometimes they might want to mention the amount. If it's the university, it's usually very difficult to get, I don't know why, from the postgraduate funding office, a stamped letter to confirm that they're going to be funding my studies or that they gave me a scholarship. Trust me, a simple letter sometimes doesn't work. It needs to be stamped and confirmed and be addressed to the Department of Home Affairs or to the relevant consulate or relevant you know, high commissioner's office or visa facilitation center where you are applying for. When push comes to shove, try to communicate with the International Academic Programs Office. We call the one at UCT Ayapo. They are usually very helpful in terms of getting such letters. All right, so, and then you need to have the most important, a letter, official one, confirming provisional acceptance or acceptance at the learning institution for the duration of the course. So study visas, usually it is clearly mentioned that this study visa is for Primrose ZJ Ima, has been issued at Harare or at Pretoria or at Mbavane, for, for them to go and study PhD in political studies at the University of Cape Town for three years. And then they will stamp, um, you know, from when the, the permit is valid and then until which date that it should expire. So make sure that you've got the, the confirmation of your acceptance at a university, whether provisional 
or whether it's to say that this is like confirmed acceptance it usually just works and they know what these letters look like from different universities consult your faculty office because you do get a place from a faculty and just check with the international academic programs offices for them to be able also to write to you what we call a letter of undertaking by the university to say that they will provide proof of your registration to, to say that they will inform the director general if you don't register to say also that um you know they will notify whatever it needs to be confirmed or informed sorry i'm rambling now whatever needs to be said to the department of home affairs when they need that information that the university writes a letter of undertaking and it usually comes from the international academic programs offices at the relevant university where you would have applied another thing that appears in this letter of undertaking is that it's a letter of undertaking on behalf of the registrar or principal of the university and also it just serves to confirm that they will inform home affairs when you have completed your studies. I think I've spent less time than I was expecting. Um, now, you need to have proof of payment of the visa application fee. This is done differently in different countries. I know, for example, when I was applying in Zimbabwe, I had to pay everything online with the credit card or a card that you know can do international transfers because of course i was doing a transaction to a different country it's very tricky sometimes you might have to pay with someone else's card and make sure if you've done that that you've got that person's maybe a letter from them confirming that you know they authorize that you use their card to make this payment and maybe like a copy of the of their id just in case um if you're using your own you know card to do these electronic payments then that's totally fine because you you just have to have your own bank letter or the bank letter of your parent or guardian whatever the case may be with some centers i know in eswatini you usually pay for the visa application after they've actually looked through your documents however in most cases you have to have paid everything up front if you haven't paid enough i know in south africa they usually allow you to like pay whatever is remaining whatever you should have paid so that like, you have the total paid up by the time you hand over all your documents so just check in with the centers in your country to see what they require if it's south africa with a visa facilitation centers everything is clearly spelled out on the website and then in the event for example in your current if you're in your country where there's a south african high commissioner's office just go there do a quick check in with them and see what they require you to do in terms of the payment what is the local bank account for example how much are you supposed to pay in that particular local currency and so forth and then you are going to need a proof of physical address in the republic of south africa my dear friends yo i think this is one of the most difficult documents to get and also it can impact negatively impact on your application so the first time when I applied for a study permit for my undergraduate studies, I had an offer letter from student, what's, residence officers. So I had a letter from them and that was fine because, you know, it was confirming that I'm going to be in residence for the year. And so I got my, my three year study permit in line with my Bachelor of Social Science degree because it was three years and um, that was it. And then when I needed to apply further, I remember for my honours, I also still had like a place in residence. So that was so easy because I think these officials really trust the letters that come from university residence offices. In the event that you're going to be staying with someone, make sure that you're going to be providing proof of their lease. They need to write a letter to confirm that, you know, you're going to be staying with them. And sometimes this may require the, the landlady or landlord to chip in also right whatever to say you're allowed to be staying with this person you need to provide that person's legal documents in south africa so whether you the person you're going to be staying with has a refugee permit work permit south african citizenship whatever and you need to provide those documents as in like the photocopies obviously and like a signed letter from that particular person where you are the one who you know has signed a lease agreement Obviously, your lease agreement should show that you're going to be staying within the Republic for at least one year. I have been negatively affected by this before. So, for example, the first time that I wanted to apply for, not the first time, my first PhD permit, I say first because, you know, I ended up having two PhD permits. 
when I applied for my PhD studies, I said that I was going to be staying with someone, provided their lease, proof that they pay bills and whatnot. But that person's lease was going to expire within like 10 months. And then I got an eight month study permit because they calculated when I was going to be able to get into South Africa and when that lease was expiring. Really, the argument that the lease was expiring in 10 months, I don't see how it holds because they know that leases do get renewed. So sometimes you might find that you apply for a three-year permit, they give you a one-year permit, a six-month permit, or whatever, because of the proof of accommodation you've provided. So where you can, at best, provide proof of accommodation that comes from the academic institution because it usually gives you higher chances of getting like the permit for the duration um, of your studies. So if it's three years, three years, four years, four years. Um, and then just get the documentation. Like I said, if you are under a landlord, under an agency, they, they just endorse to say that, yes, this person is going to be a tenant at this particular place. Maybe you need to provide proof that you've actually applied um, and maybe paid rent at the first deposit and whatnot. Um, I'll, I think I'll do another video about accommodation, but I think I have something similar to that. So I'll also like put up a link at the bottom of this video. And then in the event that you're a minor and you're coming to stay in South Africa, sometimes your permit application may be denied, declined if you're under 18, or in most cases they will require you to provide strong evidence that this person is your relative, where you're going to be staying, your parents have to write, si provide signed consent and whatnot. So usually I think most people do come to university in South Africa after attaining the age of 18. So yeah, just take note if you are going to be coming here and you're still under the age of 18. And then there's a part which says, in the case of a foreign state accepting responsibility for the applicant in terms of a bilateral agreement, you need to have a written undertaking from such a foreign state to pay for the departure of the applicant. This, just ask the relevant authorities. I do know that before, uh, around 2011, 2012, when I applied for my first permit, there's a payment I had to make to my government and then they had to provide a particular document to confirm that if anything happens, the government would repatriate me and so forth and so forth. So check in with the relevant offices in the country where you'll be applying from. Okay, I'm almost at the end of the list. Um, proof of medical cover with the medical scheme registered in terms of the Medical Schemes Act number 131 of 1998. To be quite honest, check with your university what medical aid services they accept. Because usually, for example, at the University of Cape Town, the International Academic Programs Offices will tell you that they accept momentum, they accept discovery, they accept, you know, they'll name the various medical aid schemes. Because they're going to be registering you before you register with your faculty or department. So you need to make sure that whatever medical aid scheme you've applied for is recognized by your tertiary institution in South Africa. By, just by meeting that standard, meeting that criteria, you know that the medical cover you've applied for definitely matches with whatever is within this Act number 131 of 1998. And you should make sure that you pay for at least one year. So if you're going to be coming to South Africa in March of 2022, but you're applying in February of 2022, just make sure that you've at least applied for medical aid that covers you from a month before you get into South Africa until the end of the year. Usually it's just safe to apply for January through to the end of December in that particular year. And that should be fine for the first time you apply for a permit you will have to renew a study permit each year for you to be able to register for the International Academic Programs Offices. So I think that's why um, the visa facilitation services people are not too fussy about the medical aid not lasting as long as like the duration of the studies that you've applied for. And then you need to have proof of sufficient financial means. This also, just double check what is stipulated. You may want to go through the Department of Home Affairs document. I stand to be corrected, but I know that in South Africa you have to have an account which shows that you have at least 12,000 rands at the time of applying and you need to provide a bank statement that is not older than three days on the day that you're submitting the application and obviously it has to cover at least up to three months. So make sure the cash flow on this and this uh, bank statement is, is quite decent and you've been floating around this 12k balance and you are above 12,000 rands. Check with the relevant offices like I said once again in the country where you're applying for. 
from so for example i know that in eswatini they would have different requirements there's a time when i thought that the bank statement i provided was fine but then they were like oh no this person is over borrowed and what not well i just had the figures they were not accepting so i advise you to just first of all check in with these offices especially when it comes to bank balances when you're talking about the bank statement especially when it comes to do they want um an online form or online form and hard copy or just hard copy and also to check what are the require extra requirements especially in terms of payments because payments do vary depending on where you're applying from usually payments are higher in countries where there's a visa facilitation service because this is like an outsourcing of a service from another office that is not directly linked to the home affairs department Whereas when you're applying, for example, at a high commissioner's office, you see that the course will be lower because you are working directly with like officials from the Department of Home Affairs who are based in another country. So I've gone through the list. I've exhausted it. I hope that this will be very helpful. In the event that you're applying for a study visa renewal, actually before I go there, you're applying for university studies. Although it may not be stated, you need to provide proof of how you got here. So yes, the university has accepted you, but you might find out some officials want to see proof of your high school um, graduation certificate, so have that on hand. If you're applying for higher degrees, you'll be asked to provide proof of your honours, your masters, your PhD, whatever the case may be, as well as the transcript. Have those in original format, in certified format, and just general photocopies. Make sure you have a track record of your academics. In the event that you need to acquire what is called, I think, a, a SACWA certificate, it's SAQA, something to do with the South African Qualifications, I think, Association, I stand to be created. Um, just make sure you've also done that to see that your, your, your documentation has been verified for you to be able to study in South Africa. I didn't need to do any of that because if you're coming out of high school, I think home affairs is usually just lenient. You're going to the university where you've applied for. In the event that you're applying for a master's or PhD or another higher qualification where you had attained sort of like a bachelor's or another tertiary qualification, you usually need to have attained um, a South African qualifications um, verification of your of your of the current qualifications you have. In the event that you're renewing your study visa, make sure that you have proof of your current registration or a letter from the institutions where you've been studying to say, yes, you've been in South Africa or you've been at this particular university studying. Make sure you've got transcripts, of course, the official ones, as well as certified copies and just general copies. And make sure that if you've got certificates, you also have these. I have a rule of thumb whereby I always have things in triplicate. The originals, a certified copy as well the, as just a general photocopy. Even when we, we're speaking about the bank statements, I do the same. The letters, I do the same. So make sure that you have that. Additionally, some centers are now taking photographs and taking fingerprints by themselves, but just check in with the relevant people where you're going to be going to. Are you going to need fingerprints from a police station? Are you going to need to bring visa type photos and what type of photos are required? I think I've done justice to this list and just speaking about some of the extra things you might want to bring. Another thing, just go there with an attitude of humility. Because you might just meet people that are rude, you meet people that are intimidating because they know that you want the study permit. And if you go there with your feisty self and you also want to show and flex muscles, your day might end badly. If they keep sending you back to get more documentation, ex patient, even if it's bothering you inside, I've had to like go back to the same office thrice in one day, but like, you know what, at the end of the day, I got everything sorted and I just try to be calm in the moment. Then when I get home, I cry. If they ask you questions in an intimidating way, try and hold back, ask them to, to clarify what they're saying and whatnot. If someone calls you stupid or other names, leave it until the end of the day to complain to the relevant authorities, but just go there and yeah present your, your calmest self. I wish everyone who's going to be applying for a study permit or study visa rather, or a renewal, all the best and all the best with your studies as well. Please remember to share, but before you share, make sure you've subscribed to the channel. You've also liked the video and if you've got any comments, questions, feel free to put them in the comment section and we can engage further on that. Bye.